Let me first thank the organizers. Of course, this is a great meeting. Uh, you can sit down. Thank you. <laughs> and um, if you notice, uh, basically my title is the same title as the one by Zander. Uh, but I have molecules here, so I'm going to talk about molecules. So let me first start by saying where I come from and who the, my, my team was. So this work was done in Barcelona. All of us were in Barcelona, well, except uh, Jean-Pierre Goyac, who is from uh, Senares in uh, Orsay. And uh, only Roberto Robles stays in Barcelona right now. And Richard Corita did the PhD thesis there and now moved to first K KIT and then to Regensburg. That is also in Alemania, in case that you don't know where it is. <laughs> and uh, uh, Paola Bufager went back to Argentina. Uh, she is a member of CONICET now and she's doing research there. Uh, myself now, I am in San Sebastian. So uh, San Sebastian is this, uh, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with aesthetics, but it's something like that, aesthetics, you know, this comic in France. So uh, this is like, a, a aesthetic was uh, living somewhere here, well, now I'm living like somewhere here. It's also a small place, it's kind of protected against, uh, topologically protected against Spanish people, we are Basque. <laughs> and uh, well, it's 20 kilometers away from France. It's a beautiful place. I really recommend you guys come if you can. We have probably the best center of research in the topologically protected Spain uh, area, <laughs> uh, from Spain, whatever. And uh, well, and I, I'm going to talk about theory, but also about experiments. And I'm going to try to talk about molecules and surfaces, how you can see this with STM and what is the interesting uh, magnetic properties that you can have in the systems. So the first molecule I'm going to talk about is the copper thalocyanine, th thal thalocyanines. Uh, you've already seen them, uh, Katarina has talked about it, the, um, I think, um, also Cyrus, and different people have been talking about these molecules. Uh, they are magnetic molecules. And actually, in this case, you're going to see, we, you can see condo, and you can see excitations at the same time. The second molecule we'll talk about is this double-decker with 2,000 names and, and an F electro, uh, electron uh, metal, this terbium atom here. And this... Uh, I'm going to show that, okay, you can have a lot of magnetic moment in, in, the, in the metallic core, but what is important is what is happening in the ligands. That's what it's going to give you condo at the end of the day. And at the end, I will, give, I will just show you an application of molecular uh, mag uh, magnets that can serve to uh, give a certain spin to a current, okay? So, uh, copper thalocyanine. Uh, this is, is this kind of molecule. You have uh, four ligands here that are basically benzenes. You have these nitrogen atoms. You actually have four nitrogen atoms that are coordinated to a metal atom in the center. This metal atom is a 3D metal atom typically, and it has a uh, valence of two plus. So, uh, when you put iron atoms, what you find is that the full molecule acquires a spin of one. If you uh, put a cobalt atom, it acquires a spin of one half. If it's nickel, it's non-magnetic, and if it's copper, it's, it's spin one half. And why is that? It's basically because the ligand field uh, is going to split your D levels, and then when you fill them up, you're going to find different spins. So, for example, in the case of copper, you have nine electrons, and you're going to recover basically the same as you would have in the Huns rule case, where everybody is the generate. Uh, but if you go to nickel, you realize that if I remove this electron from here, I'm going to have like something like a closed shell, something like totally covered here, and this one is going to be empty and it's going to be seen a, a, a singlet. So now uh, our experimental colleagues in Barcelona, they uh, measure with STM at low temperatures this molecule on silver 100, and here you have the uh, conductance, they measure as a function of the applied bias, you see it, it goes from minus 100 millivolts to plus 100 millivolts, here they measure in the ligands, you know, in the center of the molecule it's red, and in the uh, blue means in the, in the ligands, just putting the, the tip on top of the ligands. And well, this, this, this is just corrected by some background, so if it's negative, don't pay attention to that. Well, the, 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 the important message here is that only nickel and copper have condo. Iron and cobalt don't have condo. And um, if you look carefully here, you see that basically in the red spot is on the, um, in, in the center of the molecule, the red curve, and you only see the, uh, the, 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 the cone in the ligands. You can see it also here. Here they just take this uh, peak and they just plot where the peak is all, all over the molecule, and you see that it's around the molecule just saying that it's going to be in the ligands, both for nickel and copper, and both are very similar. Sorry, Blue is uh, on the ligands? Yes. But there's a small bump in Yeah, but it's, uh, it's smaller than this one, right? Yeah. Okay, okay so then the condo one is in the... Um, <laughs> 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 well, it's probably some tip effect. The tip is probably large enough 
So then you see, uh, when, when, you, when you're here, you're probably also seeing something from here. And, uh, well, it's, it's more difficult to see. But you see, yeah, there is something in the, in the center of the molecule. Okay. Um, now, but the message I want to give you is that here in copper, on top of the, uh, of the condo peaks, you see these two satellite peaks. Okay. And we are going to try to understand what these are. So I'm going to uh, focus on only this example here. So we did the FT calculations, copper uh, 1000 in on silver 100, you have here, this is the spin density, so you basically see that the spin is localized basically in the, in the ligands that you expect, but there is also spin in the center of the molecule, okay? And now you can understand because I said that the D electrons will have one spin, it will be spin one half, okay? This is, will be the singly occupied molecular orbital in, in the free gas, in the free, in the, in the free molecule case, okay? If you're not, you don't put it on the surface. But when you put it on the surface, what you realize is that basically the molecule becomes negatively charged, okay? And there is the magnetic moment goes from one magneton bore, bore, one bore magneton in the free gas case, in the free molecule case, to 1.32. So there is certain um, uh, magnetic moment going into the ligands. And actually this resembles very much to the free uh, molecule case where you see that it's two uh, Bohr magnetons. So the molecule, when it's negatively charged, wants to be a sp uh, spin equal one. And this is ferromagnetically coupled. We can actually, uh, we computed this ferromagnetically coupling and it, it turns out to be in the order of 40 mV. It's very close to the, uh, to the uh, distance here that is 30 mV electron volts, roughly. Okay, so... <laughs> Uh, with a lot of care. <laughs> um, basically, you, you do the, uh, bro well, this is broken symmetry, the DFT, so you have the uh, triplet, you have the almost singlet, okay, then you have to correct the difference in energy between two, so it's two times J, because I'm doing the broken symmetry one, and that's how we calculate it, okay? And you can do it in, the, in, the, in, in this case. The, in this case, it's much more complicated because you need some constraint DFT, and so we only did it here, okay? Uh, and, uh, well, what the, the, the bottom line of all of this is that the molecule wants to be a, a, a spin equal one, but then you're going to have the, the, the condo effect, okay, on top of it. So, uh, how do we do the condo effect? The condo effect, what we did was this multi-orbital non-crossing approximation, so we included, and the idea to do that was to take the, our DFT calculations and write a Hamiltonian like this, and then what we did is use a basis set that is a vanier, a maximally localized vanier basis set. So that allows us to, uh, uh, to make a difference between the uh, impurity, the orbitals that are going to contribute to the condo effect, and the single electron that is just our block states from the metal, right? And it, it, just by doing this transformation, you immediately get the, get the couplings that uh, couples from the impurity into the, the metal. Now with that, you can, you can define this quantity here that is the quantity that enters in all the NCA calculations. It's how the uh, orbitals, the molecular orbitals that here are M that are diagonalizing this guy here, talk to the uh, substrate or talk between them. Okay, here is a non-diagonal term, for example. If you are in the diagonal terms, what you realize is that this is just the, the inverse of the lifetime, uh, okay, in, in, uh, in a fermi golden rule, if you want to. Now, the off-diagonal terms, when you use the molecular orbitals, are strictly zero. So this means that the mo these are defined channels. The different molecular orbitals don't talk to each other through the substrate. These are the channels through which an electron from the, um, from the substrate is going to go into the molecule and come back, okay? And we have two channels. We have the channel coming from the ligands, which I call here the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital, because in the free molecule, this is the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. And we have one electron, one, one channel that comes from the hybridization with the D electron in the, in, in the center of the molecule, okay, the SOMO. And you realize that when you compute this thing, basically the LUMO is 10 times larger, it's 10 times more hybridized to the substrate than the SOMO, okay? So if you go and make any estimation of the condo temperature, you're going to find that there are like 10 orders of magnitude in the condo uh, temperature coming from one or the other. So this uh, leads us to believe that we are in front of an underscreen condo effect. Why? Because we have two orbitals, one that is interacting and the other one that is not interacting. But we have two electrons that are ferromagnetically coupled, so it's a single is, is S equal one, right? So we have one channel basically to screen an S equal one system. Uh, but we also have the excitation from the triplet to the singlet, okay? So we can put this in our Hamiltonian and solve it with NCA, and then we get this kind of result. This is 
uh, the uh, projective density of states on the molecular orbitals or our spectral function. And well, you see that you very much recover the same features as the one for the copper thousandine. You get two satellites and you get the, the main condo peak. Okay. Now the difference with the uh, nickel thousandine is that you don't have this excitation because you're in a spin one half. If you're in a spin one half system, you only have one electron in the ligand. Okay. Uh, now let me analyze a little bit this this um, this projective density of states, this spectral function. So what we did is we assume that we have perfect spins here, okay? And now we can, uh, you can see that you can, you can separate in the different spin, uh, your, your uh, spectral function. If you do that, you realize that this peak is purely spin equals zero. This peak is totally spin polarized to S equals zero. And this peak is totally spin polarized to S equal one. And I don't know, you guys, you guys are probably already sleeping, but I was shocked with that. I mean, I didn't expect that, why? Well, because when uh, I was doing these excitations with spins uh, in IETS, and this is the kind of picture we get, right? If uh, you are looking at the IV, you have a region here where you're not exciting anything, so you're in the linear regime, everything is fine. And then at some point, you open a new channel, so your current increases. And then you see it here in the, con in the uh, conductance, because of course the conductance is more or less abruptly changing. When you include the new channel, this equals zero. What does that mean? It means that here and here, I expect to have the transition S equal one to S equal zero. So I expect to find them both. <laughs> but no. And there is this very nice experiment that I like a lot. So I have to thank uh, uh, Kirsten von Bergman, uh, Markus Ternes, uh, Sebastian Loth, Andreas Heinrich for doing this experiment, where they show that actually these two peaks, well, this is, let me, let me just, be, uh, Markus already talked about this, but let me just say a few words about this. So this is a spin one half system with, um, uh, he, he just arrived, uh, with, with, uh, with spin one half, okay? So now you apply a magnetic field, and what it ha it's, it's going to happen is that one of the spins is going to align, uh, the, spin is going, excuse me, the spin is going to align <laughs> with the magnetic field, so that will be your ground state, right? And then you, if you apply no bias, you can flip the electron to the uh, opposite direction, and that is going to be an inelastic effect, it's the same thing. It's just an inelastic effect. And what they see is that it's an inelastic effect, and here you see that it's totally spin polarized. One is spin polarized, the below the Fermi energy is again spin polarized with the ground state, and above the Fermi energy is, um, well, the, the, the uh, excuse me, positive bias, is uh, uh, totally polarized um, <coughs> uh, with the excited state, the one that is uh, contrary. So indeed there is a spin polarization of inelastic peaks. And this has been found in, in, in uh, many other calculations, like the ones by Rorabas and Aligia, or the ones by Zitko, where uh, you induced uh, this uh, splitting with the C2 uh, with the magnetic field. And uh, well, the, I think the, the message here is that it is very simplistic to think that just the inelastic effect is to open a, a, a new channel. And indeed, that the, uh, the electron is proving the excited density of states, in this case, the, our S equals zero, when you are looking at the positive bias and you are in the tunneling regime, huh? you are really, one of your electrodes is very decoupled from the, other, the, uh, from, from the system that is being excited. And a negative bias, you excite the ground state. Well, you're not excited, you see that. Um, so, let me now, uh, I'm already exhausted, uh, yeah, still a long time to talk. Let me just talk briefly about the turbine uh, double-deckers. So, these are 2,000 inches, you see that they're rotated 45 degrees. And you put one terminal atom that is going to bind the two um, thousand names, whatever it's pronounced, together. Uh, and then, uh, well, they see it, and they basically see the ligands when see, they see the SDN tip. And now, the thing is that when they look at the DADV, they see a peak appearing and just where the ligand sits, only in the outer part of the molecule. And this can be um, connected with the fact that in these molecules, you have an impaired spin directly in the, in, in the, in the, in the ligand, okay? You, and this is going to cause you condo. So then the idea we had was, well, what happens if you put a cesium atom there, what? Why? Because cesium atom easily gives one electron, and then this electron is going to go to the ligand of the molecule, and it should just pair and remove the spin. And this is what, uh, what, what experimentally they saw. They put the cesium atom, and you see from a case where they see, a very, well, this, this is very bad, well, this peak here, it disappeared completely. So then this is kind of sort of a spin doping. You can eventually think about experiments where you can change the, um, the, your spin composition by adding these kind of atoms. 
So um, after the talk by David Jacob, I couldn't, I, couldn't, I couldn't help it. I had to talk about this. So I added this, this couple of references, uh, transparencies. And this is now, well, I talk about the excitation triplet to singlet. Now I'm going to talk about the excitation singlet to triplet. So here what I do is just I change the sign of J, OK? So, uh, and uh, well, you, then you get this, this is a spectral function again as a function of energy. Here you have the uh, excitation threshold. So if you do a one electron theory, you find this kind of behavior here. And now when you uh, do it with NCA, for example, then you get these, uh, these uh, shoot ups, these quasi condo peaks uh, that, well, we, I think uh, uh, Marcus has shown that it appears when you have elastic effects and, and condo at the same time, right? Um, now, the message I want to give here is that if you follow the thresholds when you're going to open your channels here, this is, this is the, what you expect, the, the blue line, you realize that it does not coincide when, where, where the peaks are for the quasi condo peaks. And actually, the, 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 the impression that you have is the same that you were talking the other day, is that as you crank up the, 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 the condo coupling, what it's going to happen is that you reduce the, uh, the excitation gap. Okay, and so we went ahead and we did a, a systematic calculation of this. Now the excitation energy, we call it I for obscure reasons. And delta I is how much you renormalize, how much you are closing your gap, okay? And you see that uh, delta I as a function of the uh, excitation energy follows this kind of curve, which is based asymptotically is this kind of behavior here. It's the energy divided by the log of the energy, okay? And this behavior here, is uh, typical of condo, of condo systems, and it has been found, for example, when you look at the magnetic uh, splitting of a spin one half system. This is what Moore and Wen did with this spin on uh, density of states calculations, and they find exactly the same thing. How the energy gap is renormalized is just the energy divided by the log of the energy. Okay? Um, so again, this is not surprising if you think that splitting with a magnetic field is exactly an inelastic effect, okay? And I think this is exactly what you guys are finding, huh? This quantum tunneling, you can call it quantum tunneling or tomato, but it is uh, an excitation, <laughs> right? Uh, well, sorry about that, that was a bit mean. Um, <laughs> you should have told me this before. Um, so molecular spin filters, let me just try to uh, finish my talk with this example of uh, molecular spin filter. So what is that? A molecular spin filter is a molecule that you're going to put between two electrodes and then what you expect is that this molecule is going to just leave one spin direction go through your system, okay? So uh, there, uh, there is this family of good spin filters that are these ferrocene-like molecules. So ferrocene is an iron atom that is sandwiched between two cyclopentadienyl, so it is five carbons with hydrogens, so it's almost like a benzene but with a C5 instead of a C6. And uh, then you have two of them. And now here in this case, this, this, what, what people have been doing is to put, to, to make like a chain of these molecules, to make a molecular chain with this thing. And the uh, spin um, um, filtering properties were increasing. Uh, this thing was getting more and more spin polarized. So um, here what we did is we put cobalt. Why? Because we, uh, cobalt has, uh, localizes all the spin in this kind of molecules. Iron doesn't want to be spin polarized. When, when you are putting it between synchropentadienyls, and uh, we computed the magnetic anisotropy. And we find that this thing has a fairly large magnetic anisotropy for this kind of molecules of 1.69. Why we need to have the magnetic anisotropy? Well, you know, because we want to fix the spin. Otherwise, it will not work as a spin filter. Uh, this is something that I guess people that have been computing this for the last uh, five years didn't realize yet, but you need to fix, be able to fix the spin, otherwise you don't, you don't filter it. Okay. So um, the, um, what we did was to do what it's customary in this case. You compute transport using density functional theory, and we can do it applying a bias. And even if we apply a bias, we find what other people have found, that these things are very good spin filters. You can really have a, a spin polarized current, right? But this is a... Uh, Elastic calculation. There are no spin excitations. There is no thermal effects. It is a simple uh, transport calculation. So if you include excitations, what you expect to find is here you have the conductance, here you have the bias again. It's again that when you go over this magnetic and isotropy energy, you're going to open channels of excitation. Your, your spin, instead of being uh, at one direction, you're going to be able to, 
to move it to the other direction and then your current will not be spin polarized or the spin polarization will drop. Here it drops to one third basically. Well, if you want to see more of what we've been doing with uh, spin filters and spin excitations, you can see this, this reference here. But let me now move on to what happens if you have like a difference of temperature between two electrodes. Why, why would you have that? Well, when you have currents in systems and the system is not equally coupled to both electrodes, like it's typically happening in these devices, then you expect that there will be some temperature effects, like some inelastic effects that will warm the electrodes in a different way, right? So uh, then you can just um, look at the first order change in temperature of your current. This is just the Landauer formula. If you do that, you realize that this boils down to just having the uh, derivative of your transmission, electronic transmission, uh, with respect to the electronic energy, uh, the Fermi energy. So if you compare the spin up and spin down channels, you realize that here the slope is larger than here. So uh, you would expect that you, would, you can get a, a large Seebeck effect coming from the minority spin, which will increase the conductance of that channel and will kill the spin polarization. And indeed, this is what happens. Uh, for here, well, we assume a, a, just some number to have some idea. Uh, this is 10 Kelvin. We assume a difference between the two electrodes. And you see that the, the uh, polarization drops down to 20 something percent. Uh, now, if you ramp up the bias, what is going to happen is that your normal conductance is going to win over the thermal conductance and you will erase that. At higher bias, this doesn't happen anymore, okay? Um, well, so this means that you have like a, um, if you look at, this, uh, at these numbers, you have like a window of energy. At very low uh, bias, excuse me, a window of biases. Well, at very low biases, typically the Seebeck effect is going to kill your spin polarization. At high biases, the inelastic effect is going to kill your, 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 your spin polarization. So let me conclude my talk by saying that uh, we think that DFT is a very useful uh, tool and you can even learn from it uh, in correlated systems like Kondo. Uh, I've shown you that for copper phthalocenin, it's a system where you have Kondo and excitations at the same time and you can see it with the, uh, with the STM. Uh, for more complicated molecules, you can in, uh, think about making structures with atom where you put an atom that is going to give spins and you're going to have something like a spin doping effect. Uh, we've seen that you have this logarithmic normalization of the uh, excitations when you include the condo coup coupling. And well, in spin filters, watch out for spin excitations and thermal effects. So uh, let me just thank my collaborators, uh, the Gambardella group in Barcelona, who is now in Zurich, and Tadahiro Komeda, who is in Sendai. And well, you know the rest of the people. Thank you very much. <laughs>